Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some of you probably will remember a story I told you last year that Taylor shared with us. It was, I think, profound. It was a pivotal in my life. When his, his friend in Serbia, Father Radovoy, had lost his two children and wife in a car crash. And Taylor saw him for the first time, and he said to him, I'm sorry for your tragedy. And Father Radovoy said to him with a straight face, as Taylor described it to me, Taylor, what I have lost is no tragedy, it's just something hard. To lose the kingdom of heaven is a tragedy. And that is true. We all go through difficult things, we all go through trials. That's not in itself the end. It's not something to despair of, because the only thing to despair of is losing paradise. I was listening to a uh, monastic the other day talking about the only real tragedy, the only real failure in life is to fail to become a saint. That is the failure. It's not a failure to not have money, to lose your families, to lose health, to lose anything, but to lose sanctity is a huge thing because God calls us to be saints, to be real saints. And sometimes in that we have difficult times. Hard, hard things happen. The man in the gospel today had a hard life, but in and of itself, that was not a tragedy. What would have been a tragedy was if he had failed to receive the forgiveness of his sins. Had the Lord not healed him from his infirmity, he still would have had a great, great victory because he would have been forgiven his sins. Sergei Palamas, very different than the man with the palsy, but purposely gave up everything and made everything difficult so that he might attain the kingdom of heaven, and that he might not have that loss. The difficulty with, for me, at least in a homily like today's, is there's so much to say about Gregory Palamas. There's not enough to say about St. Gregory Palamas. There's very few saints that are really more pivotal to our theology than Gregory Palamas. He is really the culmination and summit of the fathers, because in him, all those teachings are really brought together. In him, everything they taught, and the point of it all, is brought together and brought before the faithful that this message is necessary for our salvation, the dogmas of the fathers. It is vital that we understand it. Today, in Thessaloniki, there was a procession, I'm sure, there every year, through the streets with his relics, and many wonders are always worked. Taylor and I had the blessing to venerate St. Gregory's relics. I had the blessing to stand in the very spot where he preached those homilies that I was reading this week. And... It's a profound thing. St. Gregory came from a very noble family, born in 1296, proposed in 1359. But he decided early on, when he had everything in his hands, his father was a very holy man, by the way, a very great man of prayer. And Gregory had the world at his fingertips. Emperor Andronicus was willing to give him everything and raise him up the ranks. But Gregory sought a greater wisdom. Gregory sought the spiritual life. And so, Gregory, who had as high an education as you could imagine at the time, when you read his writings, you realize he was a quite educated man. He knew what he was talking about, philosophically, theologically, everything. But that's not where he got his real theology. He got his theology by renouncing the life that he knew, fled and went to Vatopedi, became a simple monk put himself under an elder, Nicodemus. Eventually, after he reposed, he moved to various monasteries in the Holy Mount, eventually becoming the abbot of Esfagmenu. He, they, didn't, they didn't stay there long, there was too many factions. He ended up in a monastery in Berea, you know, outside of Thessaloniki, various places. You know, we have pirates attacking the Holy Mountain at the time, we have the Latins attacking the Holy Mount occasionally, we have Many different things. The Serbs attacking Thessaloniki, he had to go out of there. It's a different time in the world then. Wherever he was, he lived very simply, a very serious ascetic life. He denied everything that he knew. He rejected the philosophy, the pagan philosophy that he learned. But when he came to the town, he realized eventually he had this vision, of course, where he had this cup of milk in his hands and began to churn the wine as it poured out of his hands and he realized that he was being called to come share that beauty that he had, had matured with the faithful. And he came and he was asked to defend the church because this heretic had risen up, Barlam the Calabrian, who eventually after he rejected orthodoxy became a cardinal by the way. 
and then later on Echindinus, who was of the same mindset, they rejected Gregory's teaching. They rejected the teaching of the Holy Mountain. They rejected the teaching of the Church, of how we know God. As Metropolitan Herodias Volacos defines it in his works, Valam thought that the only way to know God was through philosophy and conjecture. We could know Him with our minds. It leaves out something very important. And the mind is fallen, and broken. Gregory said absolutely not. He knew him empirically by experience. By purity of heart was the only way to know God. But by purity of heart, because as we know, there have been illiterate people in the world who knew God far better than the greatest philosophers. But there have been philosophers who knew God fairly well too. Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, Gregory Palamas. He knew him so well not because of his brilliance of mind, but because of his brilliance of the spiritual mind, his noetic faculty, because of his prayer. He experienced God. He experienced that uncreated light himself. The Latins were so intent on preserving what they call the simplicity of the Godhead, his absolute transcendence, that they made it to where God was unknowable, except through thoughts. And this light of Tabor was nothing but created, almost a mirage, to give us a little bit of a blessing to see something. <clears throat> But Gregory firmly, with the ancient fathers, Gregory of Nyssa in particular I'm thinking of, rejects this, that absolutely not. The light of Tabor was God himself, it was the uncreated light of God, which was in for all ages. It was his energies in which we can know God. It wasn't it breaking him up into different parts, as Varlam accused him of. God has his essence, which is unknowable, and his energies by which he allows us to know him. God is a mystery. And it is profound. But for long, you resorted to such thing as calling, you know, the the Hezekas of the Malsiki, calling them navel gazers. That's where that word comes from. Because they look down in their chest as they pray. And this method of the Hezekastic prayer. Why is this important? Because without this, we can't know God. This is the method of teaching of the church. The church teaches we can know God by following those commandments, by being pure, and by entering into silent prayer to the presence of God, by calling on the name of Jesus. Preserves this teaching. This was the experience of the fathers. And of course, it won out at Orthodoxy in three councils. As a matter of fact, it was proposed at the recent council in Crete, which of course was a mixed bag, but it was proposed there by people like Metropolitan Herotheos that these three councils be recognized as the ninth ecumenical council, the Photian councils being the eighth, about the filial play. And these are very important, very important. And I do, I do call them the ninth council, by the way. My spiritual father did as well. Because they are accepted fully by the Orthodox Church. Everything about them are Orthodox. Gregory was rejected over and over in his life. One by the people who preferred one emperor over the other one at some point, and they felt he was on the wrong side. He was rejected by various monastics, if you can understand. He was obviously rejected by the West to this day, by most of the West, by the Latins. He is rejected as a heretic. Some of them are seeing the light on that a little bit, thank God. But Gregory was also captured in a boat one time, going to Constantinople by the Muslims for a year. Beaten, but had dialogues with them. I would have loved to have heard these dialogues. He suffered for his faith. Only went through something hard, not a tragedy, to lose the kingdom of heaven. What does this have to do with the gospel today? This man, I decided to read St. Gregory's homily on it. Because there was no Gregory Palamas Sunday when Gregory Palamas was preaching about this man. This is the second Sunday of Lent to what he would have preached. Interestingly enough, as an aside, he took this homily and by the end he wove it into why people shouldn't talk about secular things in church and make jokes. I'm disciplined speaking in church and why the church should be a silent sanctuary where only the things that God has spoken about. And he eventually compares it to the fire of Korah, which is illicitly offered. And Korah was burned up. Read Moses. You'll hear about it. Because these words are not proper offerings within the church of God. Only holy things are worthy of the sanctuary of God within the heart. But that's an aside. Gregory marvels at this 
paralytic. The faith that he had. Yes, there's faith with these four men that bring him, take him to the roof. But the man himself, in the condition he was in, had nothing. Nothing. Had no health, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything for himself, was subject to the whims of others. Had stripped himself of all worldly power, of any glory. These Pharisees, the people that are angry that he's forgiving sins, who had everything and wanted their prestige, the man had none of it, not one bit. So, he comes into the midst by his own choice. He wasn't pleading for these people not to take him into the presence of the Lord. He wanted to go into the presence of the Lord. He felt that he could be healed. Gregory marvels at this man. He stripped himself of all worldliness. Some of it intentionally, some of it not. Didn't worry about what everyone thought. He only wanted Christ, much as Gregory. St. John Chrysostom, looking at the same thing, marvels at the man himself because the Lord says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Calls him son, first of all, which is a beautiful thing. The man doesn't protest. What are you doing saying, my sins are forgiven? I came here to be healed. We're talking about my sins. You didn't do like us, so want to hide who we really are. Very embracing of this. He comes into the midst of all these people, just in ridicule, as John Christopher marvels at. And the Lord shows them, by a much lesser means, that he can heal even that. The forgiveness of sins by telling him to rise up and walk. And the man gets up and walks and marvel at this because this is a man who had not walked for goodness knows how long or anything, any physical strength. So by this time, his bones, his muscles are withered. And he gets up in full strength, totally restored, and carries his bed and walk. And we too, when we come to confession to be healed, when we confess our sins, must not walk away as if nothing happened. Because the Lord tells each and every one of us, son, go and sin no more. He says, take up your bed and walk, which is an action, which is to live, which is to put away those past things, whatever it was you brought, and really radically try to change your life by whatever means is necessary. To change your life, to follow the gospel commandments, to be a true disciple of Christ, People that come into this church have the fullness of the gospel. They have the fullness of the orthodox faith, which is synonymous with the fullness of the gospel. And that should be changing every one of us radically. When people meet us, they should see that person is an orthodox Christian because their life has been transfigured. It hasn't remained the same. They aren't the same as the rest of the world. They may dress a little bit like us. They may eat a little bit like us certain times of the year. They may do some of the same activities we do. They may work in the same jobs, but they are different. They forgive people around them. They don't bear grudges. They don't use foul language. They don't become angry so easily. They yield to others. They pray. They say their prayers no matter what. They keep the fast. They cross themselves in public. They're not ashamed of the cross of Christ, which so many in this day and age are. Gregory Palamas is not ashamed of the cross of Christ and bore his entire life, as this paralytic did. St. Gregory is one of my favorite saints for a multitude of reasons. St. Gregory is showing us the way to God, right, that way of life. And he's calling all of us, not just the monastics in the caves, not just the people at Vatopedi or Esfigmeno or any of these wonderful monasteries, he went out and told the lay people, as a matter of fact, it's in his homilies, how to say the Jesus prayer for the laity. He encouraged the people to enter into the prayer of Christ. And of course, the prerequisite to that was humility and following Christ. Jesus' prayer is not much good if we do the Jesus prayer and then go out and break the commandments right and left. It doesn't make a difference. So Gregory gave us the fullness of the gospel. He did many different angles on St. Gregory. If you read his works, you can see theology of the highest degree, which is well beyond most of us. But 
when you read his homilies to the faithful and you read a man who is profoundly pastoral, a man who is deeply, deeply rooted in the scriptures and the fathers of the church, but more than that, he was deeply rooted in practicing it himself. He lived the life of the gospel. And because of this, his renunciation of the high and mighty things of the world were not his demise. He didn't fail. Gregory gained paradise. It wasn't a tragedy. While there were much, many, many, many hardships, as with the paralytic, Gregory took up his bed and walked. Brothers and sisters, God forgives your sins. He was my sins. And he calls us to take up our beds and walk along with Gregory Palamas in the path of the fathers. Amen.